Good morning. Welcome once again to our study today. We are in Mark chapter 12. We began here yesterday and uh, we see we have we are kind of in the middle of a parable that Jesus gave that really uh, is a detail for us of Israel's history. And uh, as we come into Mark chapter 12 and verse 1, we see this nation planted, um, established by God, called out. Of course, we know through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and then Jacob's 12 children. And uh, we also saw the prophets that God had sent to the nation of Israel in verses 2 through 5 and how they had triggered them. And now as we come into verses 6 through 12, he talks about the nation's last prophet. And of course, we know that this is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And I want to read these verses today, and then we're going to look at what he tells us in these verses um, regarding their treatment of the Lord Jesus Christ and how they respond to what it is that Jesus says. In Mark chapter 12, I'm going to begin reading at verse 6 today. I'm going to go down to verse 12. <coughs> Excuse me, Mark chapter 12, verse 6. It says, Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him, and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen, and will give the vineyard unto others. And have you not read this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. So as we come into these verses today, there are several things that we can see here about their treatment of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's been several prof, uh, several servants that were sent. Those, of course, picture for us the prophets. And he talks about how they um, ridiculed these prophets. They did not listen to them. And ultimately, they killed them. Now, as we come into these verses, we find that the Bible says that he, last of all, he sent his son. And, of course, the son is pictured uh, as the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see in verse 7 the plot that they have to kill the son. <coughs> it says, but those husbandmen said among themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. They want to kill the son, and it is not because of mistaking identity, but rather they want to kill him because he, they knew who he was. And by some twisted reasoning, they thought that they would receive the inheritance if they killed the son. And even as Jesus is speaking these words unto them, we know that the Jews are plotting to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. And this was seen from what we're seeing in Mark chapter 12 and in verse 12. But let me also show you their attitude in John 11, verse 47. You'll have to <clears throat> pardon my voice today. I'm in the midst of having a bit of a cold and, and my throat's been bothering me a little bit. But I'll do the best that I can. In John 11, 47... Uh, and onward, we see their plot to kill Jesus, uh, John eleven forty-seven 47 to 53. It says, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a, counselor, a council and said, What do we for this man doeth many miracles? If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this speaking not of himself, but being a high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. So we see that they've been plotting all along to kill the Lord Jesus and desire to know how uh, they would put him to death. And as Jesus goes through Mark chapter 12 and talks about the only son being sent, indeed he is talking about himself. And as we um, come into verse 8, we see the terrible deed is done. They, they kill the son. It says, 
and they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. And then there's a question that is both asked and answered as we come into verse 9, where it says, What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He shall come and destroy the husbandmen and will give the vineyard unto others. So there we see that the husbandman is destroyed and the vineyard is given to others. Keep in mind, this is a fulfillment of a covenant that God made with the nation of Israel at Sinai. And it is not only made at Sinai, but it is a covenant that is accepted by the nation of Israel. Let me read that covenant for you very quickly. We find it in Exodus 19, verses 5 through 8. It says, Now therefore, if, go to see if there, if ye will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then, notice the then, you can connect the if and the then, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has said will we do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So, as we look into those verses, we see there that God had made this covenant with the nation of Israel. And that they had agreed to this covenant that Jesus had made with them. As we see the if and the then in verse 5. If you will do this, then I will do this. And the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, agreed unto it. But as we come back into our parable that is written here, we see that Christ is the rejected stone in Mark chapter 12. And in verses 10 and 11, it says, And have you not rigged the scripture, the stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Christ very clearly here is picturing himself as the rejected stone. This is actually a fulfillment of prophecy, for if we read in Psalm, in chapter 118, and verses 22 and 23, we find that several hundred years before Jesus says this, this is what's said in Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23, the stones which the builders rejected, refused, rather, is become the hig of the cor- hig stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So we see very clearly that Christ is the rejected stone. The stone in this passage and in many other passages is a symbol for us of the Messiah. It goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 17 and verse 6. In Exodus 17 verse 6 we see this stone first of all mentioned in type form for us. It says, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. This stone that was struck in this passage is a picture for us of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who would be smitten so that we could drink of the waters of life. You may say, Preacher, how do you know that? Well, let me read 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4 for you, where it says this, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock. Notice the rock in that verse is capitalized. That followed them, and that rock was Christ. (coughs) He is the one who has been rejected. He's the one who's been smitten. Listen to how Paul describes this in Romans chapter 9, and in verses 32 and 33, we read these words. Wherefore, behold, they saw it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at at that stumbling stone. And it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So the scriptures are revealing to us very clearly that Christ is pictured for us as this stone of stumbling that these people stumbled over. Now notice what it says in 1 Peter 2. Verses 6 and 8, Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. 
Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So as we look at these verses, we see very clearly that Jesus is the one who is rejecting, that he is the stone of stumbling, that he is the rock of offense, that is being talked about as we come into these verses. Um, and then the servant judge here announces a double verdict in verse 11. They had rejected the son, and they had refused the stone, and as a result of that, they would face judgment. Now, what's their reaction to this parable? It says, They sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken this parable against them, and they left him and went their way. That's Mark chapter 12, verse 12. They sought to lay hold on him, but they did not do so out of fear of the people. They knew that he had spoken this parable against him, and they went their way, but their evil purpose was unchanged. They still wanted to destroy him. Friend, let me say this today as we close. This parable that Jesus speaks here also can have an application to the church. That is not the interpretation of it, but there is an application here, without a doubt, for a church. When a church chooses to reject Christ or to reject the way that he is given. Let me remind you, friends, we are not only to be followers of him, but we are to do things according to the blueprint that's laid out in the word of God. The church is not our church. It is his church. It is his house. And he has every right to make the rules and to tell us how we run the church and what we are to do and how we are to do it. And when we choose to reject that and go our own way and think we know better, do not be surprised when the presence of God leaves the place and judgment of God is pronounced upon it. Friends, we must be careful that we are followers of him, not only with our lips, but with our lives, and that we do things in our lives and in our churches in the way that God has instructed us to do so in Scripture. The Bible tells us in the book of Timothy that a man is not crowned except he strive lawfully. Friends, we must do things according to the rules that God's laid out in his word. Have a great day.